Boonga Boonga was developed by the South Korean company. Oh no, I got it wrong. Taff system for the Japanese market. Yes! Yes! I mean, I mean, <laughs> nailed it. Hello and welcome back. I haven't recorded one of these business blah, uh, 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 brain blazers in... I, I can't even remember. It's been at least two weeks. Because I recorded a bunch, then Danny went on holiday. I mean, uh, and by on holiday, I, I actually gave him a VR headset, one of those Oculus things. I just put it in the basement for him. I loaded up a nice picture of a beach and he wore it. And now he's got like, you know, uh, bed sores around his face from wearing this VR head unit for too long because obviously he lives in my basement. Uh, what happens here is Danny, who lives in my basement, is going to, has written me. Why am I getting my tenses confused? <laughs> Do you not even speak English, fact boy? And uh, then I'm going to read it and then Sam afterwards is going to sprinkle in some somethings. I already, fine vintage memes. Yes, that's what he does. Mm-hmm. Let's go. More ridiculous video games that really existed. Oh, oh, by the way, this video is brought to you by Magellan TV. Yes, Magellan. They're uh, like a documentary streaming service. <laughs> Brilliant ad work there, Simon. What does the sponsor do? They're like a uh, thing with the, the thing. <laughs> Brilliant work. <laughs> Gonna get cancelled by my sponsors. No, but Magellan is rather good. I'll tell you a bit more about them in a bit. Please don't fast forward through the ads. It hurts Fact Boy's capitalist heart. Oh yeah, I'm making this one, because speaking of capitalism, the last one did really well, so here we are. Well, my money. Jesus, bring a little stupid ass on. One of the most valuable life lessons you're taught in a typical Rotherham school is to dramatically lower your expectations. I feel this should be just taught in every school. It's like, look, 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 you've got all these dreams. Let's not have those dreams. Let's just, let's just not, let's just not. Although I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like if someone told me at school, Simon, this is what you're gonna do, I'd be like, holy shit, what? That's better than my dreams. <laughs> don't spend too much time daydreaming about becoming a professional footballer or a rock star or an elevator designer, because that shit ain't gonna happen. Instead, you should focus your attention on the best way of conning an employer into giving you a job as a litter picker or a scrapyard laborer. Uh, one of my favorite Reddit posts that I've ever seen in my whole life, and I'm not sure if it was at, you know, it's probably not original content from Reddit. It's probably like from an old newspaper cartoon, but it was like, I can't remember what it was. If anyone could find it, please do post it in the comment. But it was like, uh, the, the cartoon was, or the meme was, my sole ambition in life is to have a desk where my boss can't see my computer monitor. <laughs> and I'm like, I 100% get it. Absolutely get it. I used to have an office job and uh, I uh, definitely had a monitor that didn't face the boss. But I felt I was quite a good employee. Although I definitely f rounds on whatever the Reddit was of the day. Maybe Dig, <laughs> D-I-G-G, anyone remember that sh No. But at least we can still live out our wildest fantasies and pipe dreams through the medium of video games. We can immerse ourselves in fantastical worlds, take on the mantle of a heroic warrior and slay evil demons, score the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl, and journey into the outer edges of the universe to explore new alien creatures and blast them to pieces. Ah, humans. What are we gonna do? We're gonna go exploring and killing! Yeah! Because that is, I mean, it's always been like, what's that, the age of exploration? and killing. What's that? Oh yeah, we're invading another country for land and killing. <laughs> it's like you could just tack on any expansion of humanity in history and just, just tack onto the end of it and killing and it always works. <laughs> I have to say I've recently been playing a lot of, I got, uh, I got like a year ago one of those Oculus Quest 2s and like in between, rec I'll like record a few videos and then I'll take a little break and I'll play some Oculus. I've been playing a game called Onward and it is tight. Like, you play a terrorist hunter. You're just like in this soldier's body and you're playing with other people online. And most of the time, they're not like screaming 13 year olds. You didn't even like me, oh my God! <laughs> you're playing with a bunch of like people who are like, yeah, let's go, Charlie team. And it's like, oh my God, it, it really gets the heart pumping. It's quite intense. I can't imagine what actual war's like. I just imagine, I'm, I'm scared playing this game. Like I take the headset off and I'm like, woo. I just felt like I was in Afghanistan or some shit. And it's like, in real life, I'd just be, you know, I'll be one of those people who signs up to the military and be like, yeah, let's go. And then I'd actually have to go to battle and I'd just be like, they'd be like, Simon, you're not built for this, are you, mate? And I'd be like, no, I'm not. Can I leave early? And they'd be like, no, you have to go to prison. Because I said, th what if, 
if you're in the military and, and then, then you train and you're like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And then you actually get to the battle and you're like a wreck just because it's like, oh my God, this shit became real. Like I'm exactly that sort of person. I'll be like, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. And then it'll get to the actual moment and I'll be like, oh my God. Like I went parachute jumping and it's like, yeah, let's do it, woo. And then you're in the plane and you're like, oh my God, shit got real all of a sudden. <laughs> I'd definitely be that person. Considering how the scope of video games, what are we talking about? Oh my god. We're half a page in and we are off the rails. Off the rails. Off the rails. The rails. The rails. The ra or if you were really brave, video games could take you into a truly dark dimension where only the mightiest and most fearless adventurer would even attempt embarking upon the ultimate quest. Stack all the shells properly in a supermarket to avoid getting fired by your boss. Oh my god, there, are, there really are some games like this, like especially in VR. There's like Job Simulator, and it's like, who would want to do Job Simulator? It's like, I already have a job. <laughs> Why would I be like, what am I going to do in my free time? More work? Woo! <laughs> Considering how the scope of video games in the 1980s was limited only by the boundary of your imagination, it's Im remar wait, not boundaries of not the oh of, of imagination, not your imagination, because you're just playing the game. If someone said to me, Simon, games are only limited by the boundary of your imagination, I'd be like, well, you got a bit of work to do, haven't you? Because like my imagination is not very good, and I also don't know how to program dick. Uh, it's still remarkable how many games from this era were based on such utterly mundane concepts. It's true that the coders at the time were also limited by relatively primitive hardware, but that hadn't prevented the earliest arcade games from the 1970s taking us on incredible adventures into the Wild West or outer space. And yet, by the 1980s, many game developers appeared to turn their attention to just emulating ordinary everyday life, the very thing that most of us were trying desperately to escape from. <laughs> you have to use the word desperately there, Daddy. It sounds so sad. Well, I'm not, not really surprising, given that you live in my basement. I mean, I work in the basement. This is being filmed in the basement. I have like one of those semi-basement things. I mean, there's windows up there, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. But as I've often described, I have a Prince of Persia star basement. There are many levels. Great job. Oh my God, we're all about the video games today. Take Paperboy, for example. This 1985 classic is fondly remembered as one of the greatest arcade games of all time, and I still love playing it today, even though I can never get past Thursday. But it's hard to ignore the fact that your whole, the whole game is based on something that you could experience in real life if you just got off your ass and went down to the newsagents to pick up a paper round. Admittedly, on a real paper round, you probably wouldn't encounter quite as many random breakdancers or angry old ladies with rolling pins or demonically possessed lawnmowers, all of which are trying to kill you. Danny, I don't know about which village you grew up in, but in mine, that was basically par for the course. You'd <laughs> be walking to school. Oh, sh there's another demonic lawnmower. Ah! But you would still have to cope with a high risk of getting bit by a real rabid dog. I don't think there are actually rabid dogs. If you get bit by a rabid dog and you get rabies, you're f***ed. I think we've talked about this before, how absolutely terrifying rabies is. Like, if you get rabies, and you become, like, the virus from a, a bitten by a monkey or whatever, and you don't get a treatment, if you get a symptom, any symptom, like the, symptom, the first symptom of rabies, you're dead. The, the, the treatment doesn't work. There are no treatments. There's been, like, two people in history who have survived rabies. So it's like, ah, oh, well, I guess I'm f***ed. And I remember talking to some... I think it, I can't remember exactly who it was, but there was definitely some doctor I knew who had done some, like, tropical medicine thing. Like, it f***ed off halfway around the world to, like, I don't know, go do doctory stuff. And he was, like, telling me about rabies. Like, people who had rabies. And he was like, yeah, 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 on my, like, tropical rotation or whatever. There was this guy who died of rabies, and he was like, it was f***ing horrible. And from that day on, I've been like, fucking don't touch animals. <laughs> well, this explains quite a bit. And at least you get paid real money every Sunday morning for your efforts. Yeah, it's barely any money. Because I, I mean, I've, I feel like I've told this story a million times, but I used to work in a news agent, and I was getting paid like minimum wage. It's like, what, five, six quid an hour back in the day? Or even less than that. It wasn't much. And the paper boys would come in, and I remember them getting paid, and they'd get paid so little for the amount of work they did. And I was like, oh my God, you guys are so poor. And I was earning minimum wage. <laughs> So you know it's not a lot of money. For those young gamers who were looking ahead to a career beyond the paper rounds, New Generation Software released a home computer title in 1984 which dared to deliver an insight into the lavish future lifestyle of a truly industrious student. It was called Trash Man. Ah yes, the next step up from Paperboy in the Sims career ladder. The name might sound quite American. We'd be more likely to call them dustbin men, or waste collectors, or sanitation engineers in the UK. Yeah, I don't know if this is just a British thing, but uh, we really come up with all sorts of crazy-ass job titles for, like, people who don't want to be called what their actual job is. 
and it would be like YouTuber. They're yeah, like advertising representative expert. That. <laughs> Although YouTube has become a surprisingly legit thing. That I used to tell people like I make videos on the internet and now I just say I'm a YouTuber and people are like, oh yeah, cool. It's like just normal. For a while it was like, wow. And now it's just like, yeah, 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 so is my cousin. It's like, oh. But this was a very British game released for the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, and Amstrad CPC. And as you might be able to guess, the game follows the madcap adventures of a trash man. From a simplistic bird's eye view as his little matchstick man character slowly waddles around the neighborhood on an epic quest to pick up every dustbin or garbage can, if you insist, America, from the back garden of every house on the street. Who would play this? I still don't understand who plays these games. It's so silly. Why would you want to simulate it? Maybe if you're like some super like turbo Saudi prince who's like, yeah, what do you do? I inherited 17 billion dollars of oil. Like, I just own an oil field, that's what I do. And then it's like, you're just lounging around and it's like, ah, oh, you just get bored of like drinking champagne and living in a hotel. And you're like, yeah, yeah, what are we gonna do? I'm gonna play as a sanitation engineer, <laughs> a dustbin man. It's like, I, I mean that maybe, <laughs> that's, the, that's the market. If that's the case, charge a lot of money for it because those guys have that money. <laughs> Frank, what the hell are you doing, man? Hey, that's my character. I'm the trash man. He must then lob the contents into the truck parked on the road and return the empty dustbin all the way back to its rightful place before the timer runs out on each of the seven levels. And then I start eating garbage. And then I pick up the trash can and I smash the guy on it. As dreary as it sounds, Trash Man is quite an entertaining little game. It plays a bit like Frogger when you're trying to navigate across the busy road with your heavy dustbin, but you also need to watch out for loose dogs and cyclists on the pavement and avoid taking any shortcuts on grass as this aggravates the residents and rapidly depletes your timer. And there are even a few splashes of early micro humor scattered throughout the game where the residents start talking to you in little text speech bubbles. Why is micro humor? It sounds like really small humor. If you're doing well, the residents will sometimes briefly and briefly invite you into their house for a few timer replenishing seconds wait 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 so the dustbin man gets invited into the house for like tea and that gives you more time to do your job because in real life if that was my dust if i was the dustbin man boss and i'd be like yo 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 fred did you stop into mrs jones's house for tea again and fred would be like yeah yeah, yeah but it replenished my timer so i got more time added to the day i'd be like fred are you smoking crack again because that's not how it works you're f fired fred get the f out. Daddy, chill. Like you said, it's all fake. For example, one nice old lady asks you, could you look at my TV? All right. Oh wait, to so like fix it. <laughs> Can you just look at my TV? Do you want to watch TV together? It's like, lady, I'm a dustbin man at work. Do you not see all the dustbins that need to be picked up? Uh, after you leave the house again, she quips, I meant mend it, not watch it. Oh, well done. Fatality. I mean, look, business place humor is not that great. But that's because I think it up on the fly. This is the joke they actually came up with. <laughs> and people say that computer coders have no funny bones. But The game was so successful that a more exotic sequel was... I thought it said erotic for a second. I was like, oh my god, what is the trash man doing to the old lady? Ah. Uh uh, exotic sequel was released the following year. Travel with Trashman saw the titular hero jetting around the world to pick up litter in a range of international locations. I have to say, I don't think, you know, normally, like, Dustbin Man, one of the things is like not on the job description is like international travel that's like sh consultants do <laughs> and it very quickly becomes a pain in the ass like i used to think it'd be the most glamorous thing to travel for work and then one year i think i had to do like five work trips and then i was like f this <laughs> It's like, why do people do this? I just want to stay home. Although the humor was a little more dubious in this one. When you visit the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, you're required to pick up all the soggy tissues discarded by weeping visitors, while a visit to a French restaurant involves picking up dead frogs from the floor. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I would say it's a bit culturally insensitive, but then, uh, then, I, I mean, around this time, there was General Custer's Revenge, which is its whole f***ing thing. However, Trashman had a positively gleaming reputation when compared to another 8-bit home computer title released in 1998, which offered yet another lucrative career option for the ambitious young gamer. And this one is a game that has left a very much darker legacy following revelations that would tragically remain unraveled for the next 20 years. Well, that's a bit of a hook, and we're going to use that point. Oh yeah, <laughs> I picked up my ancient iPad. This is an iPad from like, I think this is like an iPad 3. Fully OG. It's what I use as a teleprompter on one of my sets. I'm not sure why it's here. And then we have that. We have the new guy, one of these 
iPad Pro bad boys. I mean, they really, they really did come a long way. And next time on MKBHD, <laughs> this is not a tech channel, Simon, do your job. I'd love to do a tech channel. Imagine all the cool, like the Unbox Therapy channel. That guy just sends, gets sent cool to play around with. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> This would be amazing, but also impossible because I live in Europe and doing that would literally, by my life would just be, be dealing with customs, which is, I mean, fuck, fuck, fuck customs, man. So painful. I mean, I love you customs. Please keep sending my packages through with only extreme amounts of pain rather than pain that makes me feel like I'm being tortured to death by a communist era bureaucrat. God, we are off the rails today, aren't we? This is supposed to be a sponsor read by the glorious people over at Magellan TV. Do you think Magellan TV is named after that Magellan dude who was the first to sail around the world, except he wasn't, and it was actually like his servant slash slave on the journey that was the first guy to make it? I mean, interesting name choice, Magellan. <laughs> You'd be like, what's it? Uh, he is exploring and killing. Did Magellan kill? I don't know. I've made a video about him, but I don't remember anything about my videos because honestly, it is in through the eyes and out through the mouth sometimes, isn't it? Not such a big brain after all. Magellan TV is a new documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers for the love of history. They believe in the old adage about studying history, that you can't know where you're going until you understand where you've been. And that's all well and good. And I like that it's a talking point because it makes Magellan sound like one of those things that really big brain people are gonna buy. Why I have Magellan is just, it's entertaining. <laughs> like. Uh, Netflix and stuff, yeah, you watch it for entertainment. Magellan TV, I like to think I watch it because it makes me become, like, you know, more knowledgeable and a well-rounded person. But honestly, I'll just end up watching some, like, war documentary and be like, yeah, war! <laughs> or, like, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just for entertainment. <laughs> if I wanted to learn stuff, it'd be too much like work or learning, wouldn't it, Magellan? It. As a result, Magellan TV is one of the richest catalogues of history content available pretty much anywhere today. Everything from the Greeks to the Great War. I'm so sick of the Greeks. I mean, honestly, bit of, bit of, this ad read isn't very good, is it? <laughs> well, honestly, I've done so many, uh, Romans, oh my god, if we make another video about a Roman emperor on my biographics channel, I'm actually just going to take myself into the bathroom and, like, drown myself. I would waterboard myself, because that's how, like, I'm like, I'm so sick of that shit. But, honestly, Beat, beat goes my capitalist heart and everyone watches it. So, you know, I'll just, Sam, cue the Jason Statham meme where he's crying into his money. <laughs> uh, the Great War, that's much, like modern history, 20th century history, honestly anything in the last, it's just more interesting. I don't want to hear about another battle with swords and sandals. Ah. Their team of producers and content developers look all over the world for new documentaries to add to their library, updating it every single week. The end product is, is like if Netflix was designed by your favorite history, history professor or your favorite big brain YouTuber. Actually, he put far less of that Greek history in there, wouldn't he? So yeah, it's made by people smarter than me, basically, and that's what we're talking about. And it's... I, look, okay, the talking points are the talking points. There's no ads, there's all of this stuff. But it's just entertaining. It's really good. There's loads of stuff on there. It's all quite long. You can sit down, get some takeaway, crack open a beer or a Coke or whatever you're into, and just enjoy some Magellan. It's really rather good. More than 3,000 4K explorations of binge-worthy topics with content added every week. And then you, sh you should consider Magellan TV. Today I'm recommending... Oh, it's just left blank. <laughs> I did fill it in. Look, I've mentioned stuff before. There's lots of good stuff on there. The other day, oh, it is in 4K, and I got the, like, a big, glorious 4K TV. And I was like, well, you know, I was on the phone with my dad. And I was like talking about like enjoying, there was something we were watching and I was saying like, you know, it's just nice that it's in 4K or whatever. Or we were talking about 1080. And my dad's like, you got 4K TV? And then I realized like, wait, it's 2021, dad. Can you buy an HD TV anymore? <laughs> So if you want to make an awesome addition to your streaming lineup, just click that link in the description and Magellan is going to hook you up. Yes! Let's get back to the video. To begin with the game itself, what are we talking about? Uh, oh yeah, there's some great game that in 1988 goes all wrong and leaves a dark legacy. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Casual Criminalist, which is a podcast I do, by the way. Yes, please check it out if you're so inclined. If you're not interested in that, just leave it alone. It's cool. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit. I mean, I make a lot of stuff, a little something for everyone. I'm like the buffet of YouTube and not one of those cheap buffets. Like, I'm not like that Las Vegas buffet. All right, fact boy, you're not that great. Uh, <laughs> you're as calm, you're as smart, 
Sleeper Trolley was really... <laughs> nah, I'm like, I'm, I'm like the gas station buffet. <laughs> Are gas station buffets a thing? I feel like in America they very well could be. Sleeper Trolley was released for the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC by the budget label Mastertronic. So the good news is that it only cost a couple hundred quid to buy. Whoa, what? What? Oh, a couple of quid. Why did I just misread that as a couple of hundred quid? I'm like, that's not 2021. When the f did games become like 70 pounds or 70 dollars or whatever I end up paying? I'm so confused, like, because you just log into Steam and it's like, it's charging me in dollars, but then I get, it's international sh confusing. And my life is always like, yeah, yeah, they're like 19.99. Don't forget that 21% VAT fact, boy. Woo! From an isometric 3D perspective, you take on the role of a supermarket employee. Your job is to wander around the store while stacking shelves, cleaning up spillages, kicking out dogs, and finding lost babies. The main objective is to get to the end of the week without being sacked by your grumpy knobhead manager. <laughs> I know where this is going. Don't use his surname, Danny. He's called Trevor. And Danny didn't even include the surname because it's like, let's not name check a real person who Danny has a grudge against. Danny, you can do that on your own channel and defend yourself with your own lawyers. <laughs> That's if you were lucky enough to, but I mean, I'm sure you can absolutely slag anyone off because if you don't like someone, it's just your opinion, right? I mean, I hope so because otherwise we're in trouble. I mean, it's not like we're saying anything that's untrue. It's just like, in my opinion, XYZ person, I think's a bit of a bell and, uh, and yeah, I don't, I, that, no, I'm not a lawyer. Let's just move on. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. That's if you were lucky enough to buy the Spectrum or Amstrad versions. Although the C64 version mentions all of this stuff in the instructions, this technically superior machine can only deliver what appears to be a buggy, unfinished version in which the only element of the game that survives intact is the relentless stacking of shelves. Although graphics for other parts of the game, such as dogs and children, have since been found buried in the C64 code, the game makes no use of them. And if you can somehow complete the game without it crashing or sending you into an accidental perpetual loop, your reward is a screen to pick a pulsating mess of gobbledygook and the program has clearly felt as the program has clearly felt that nobody in their right minds would ever get that far the specky and amstrad versions aren't really that much better after coming up with such a spirit crushing concept for a slice of budget entertainment masterstroke then decided to up the stakes by making it almost impossible to understand exactly how to play it and the instructions are of no help whatsoever most people players eventually gave up after getting bored of pushing around an empty trolley with no idea how you were meant to fill it yeah this was interesting but like i feel the games in the past they never ended like i mean not that i ever played them but there was that 80s game there's that documentary about the people playing um, king kong is it called king of kong or king's kong or something like that with the the dude and he's like the best donkey kong player in the world and it's his rivalry with someone else but donkey kong you just get to a screen where the game crashes because it just gets progressively more difficult and more difficult and they're like, no one will ever get this far. And these guys master the game and they get to like, they call it a kill screen or something, where they get to the end and it's just like, that's it. You reach the end of the game. There is no end, it's just that's it. There's no more, it crashes. It's like, today, games can be finished. Like, right? Or at least they don't crash when you've got all the, like, GTA V, you don't finish it really. I mean, I guess you can finish the stories, but it's not like you reach a point and there's no game just crashes because you finished it. That's it. Weird. But whilst it may have been a lousy idea for a dreary game, there's now a much deeper problem when we look back at Super Trolley. What the hell could this possibly be? <laughs> when you take a peek at the packaging, there's a certain jolly face on the front cover, which UK gamers will, will at least instantly recognize with a shudder of horror. Why, it's none other than everyone's favorite disc jockey, TV presenter, charity fundraiser. Oh, it's gonna be, the next line's gonna be like pedophile, isn't it? It's gonna be one of these guys. Ah, oh, it's Jimmy Savile! <laughs> that famous pedophile. Uh, and this is because Super Trolley has uh, a prolific sex offender, Jimmy Savile. He was a pedo, right? I think he was. Pretty sure he was. Uh, <laughs> allegedly. Uh, and this is because Super Trolley has very unusual origins. I mean, Jimmy Savile, fortunately, he's dead now. Uh, for those <laughs> unaware of the most appalling scandals ever blight the BBC, Jimmy Savile was a key face of the corporation for over four decades between the 1960s and his death in 2011. Yet yeah, also, he's the sort of person you'd look at. Sam, just put a picture on, on the screen of Jimmy Savile now and just be like, look, look, look. I don't want to like profile people based on how they look because it's not a good thing. But uh, I mean, 
I mean, I mean, if there was a face, if there was a man who looked less like a sex offender, I've never seen it. Despite the fact that he was very creepy and largely inarticulate, he was one of Radio 1's most popular DJs of the era and the original host of Top of the Pops from 1964, returning as co-host in the final edition in 2006. He's estimated to have raised over £40 million of charity and was knighted by, knighted by the Queen in, Queen in 1990 in recognition of his fundraising efforts. What most people didn't realize until after his death is that Sir Jimmy Savile was actually one of Britain's most prolific sex offenders, using his position to assault at least 450 victims over the decades. Holy sh Jimmy! You f***ing sicko! I had no idea. I knew it was a lot. I knew it was a lot, but oh my god. His charitable... It's like, what the f*** are you up to? His charitable celebrity status meant that he was pretty much given the keys to over 28 NHS hospitals where he assaulted patients and staff alike, and although he had a preference for children... Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it was a veto. Uh, his full list of victims range from the ages of 5 to 75. I mean, I don't say this often, but he's one of those people where it's like, you know, it'd just be better if someone just shot him early on, wouldn't it? Just like, sorry, you know, just... Bad news. What? Someone murdered Jimmy Savile. Oh, no. Anyway, last week... <laughs> and it's like, we know it was. Please do... <laughs> Let's just do absolutely nothing about this and privately thank that individual. So, it now makes the stomach churn to look back at a time when Savile was the host of a Saturday tea time show on BBC for nearly 20 years in which he made the wishes of young kids come true. F Fucking hell, man. Running between 1975 and 1994, Jim or Fixin invited young viewers to write into the BBC with their burning requests. Each letter read out on the show would usually run along the lines of, Dear Jim, please could you come and fix, uh, fix it for me to join the army for a day? Or please, Jim, could you please fix it so I could spend an afternoon with Gary Glitter and Rolf Harris? <laughs> <laughs> Dear Jimmy, it'd be great if you didn't sexually assault me afterwards. That would be grand. Little Timmy. <laughs> For f sake. Uh, viewers would then see the film's footage of the wish getting granted before the lucky kid was invited into BBC Studio to meet Savile himself, who would personally hang a medal around their neck, bearing the immortal slogan, Jim fixed it for me. And it was within the sinister environment that Super Trolley was born. Eight-year-old Andrew Collett had been inspired to cop with an idea for a new computer game set in a supermarket while he was on a shopping trip with his mum. And it was at that point that they realised that little Andrew didn't have much of an imagination. At this point, his mum should have told him to try to be a bit more imaginative. I swear to God, I don't read these ahead. But instead, she encouraged Andrew to write a letter to Jim or Fix It, which asked the TV star to turn Andrew's idea into a real game. And the show hooked up with Mastertronic, who agreed to design and market the game based on Andrew's stinking dog turd of an idea, and then slapped Savile's grinning face on the cover. Perhaps it's just as well that the game was lousy as it would have felt even worse if the reputation of a classic game had been permanently soiled by the lingering presence of one of the most reviled men of the last century. Super Trolley sold poorly and was relegated to the bargain bucket after generating negative reviews in computer game press. The Spectrum magazine Crash concluded at the time, why would you call a computer magazine Crash? It's not good. This proves that Jim can't fix everything. But a bomb bomb computer game magazine. Little is known of what became of young Andrew Collard, but be sure to keep your eyes peeled for a store employee wearing a tacky medal around his neck the next time you're mooching down the cakes and biscuits aisle. Yes, yes. Shaq Fu. Pretty much every major sports star has lent their name to a video game title over the years, from Rafa Nadal to Mike Tyson to Steve Davis. Who is Steve Davis? I don't know anything about sports. But some of the some of the games are incredible. Some of them were dreadful, but the vast majority of them were related to the sport associated with the athlete in question, as you might naturally expect. No, I mean, like, supermarket sells shelf stacking with Rafael Nadal. <laughs> like, All right, <laughs> weird. Bit of a money grab there, eh, Rafa? Eh? Not always, however. An early example of curious celebrity endorsement involved former England football player and Ireland football manager Jack Charlton, who was a member of England's legendary 1966 World Cup winning squad. And I believe. That was the last time that England won the World Cup, 1966. Amazingly bad. When Algata Software released a Jack Charlton game in 1985 for the Spectrum and C64, you'd probably imagine that it would involve football somehow, somewhere along the line. Yeah, it'd be like Football Manager or something, wouldn't it? But no, they released a game called Jack Charlton's Match Fishing, which was Every bit as exciting as it would sound. Yeah, I've never played a fishing game, and I never have any desire to play a fishing game, but I know they are a big deal. Isn't the whole point of fishing just that it's an excuse to 
sit out in nature, have a chill out time, drink a beer and pretend to, to do a hobby. Isn't that fishing? So why would I want to do like a virtual version of that? A much more ludicrous example cropped up in 1994, and this involved legendary basketball player Shaquille O'Neal, who was still just a 22-year-old rising star back then. We've talked about Shaquille O'Neal before. He's more commonly known simply as Shaq. He's the guy with the 15 feet long and 30 feet wide bed, and the guy who once bought three Bentleys on the spot just because the dealer cast doubt on whether he could afford one. Yeah, that was brilliant. But uh, I mean, we talked about this before, and it's like legendary move, Shaq. But also, maybe the Bentley dealer knew who you were and was just absolutely playing you because that's a really solid way to sell three Bentleys. And you're walking out of that, that Bentley dealership here like, yeah, f you, look at my three Bentleys. And you, I'll pick up the other two later, all right? Just don't look, look after them while I'm gone. But also that dealer's in his mind like, yeah, 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 f you, I just sold you three Bentleys. When Electronic Arts released a video game featuring Shaq in the title role for the Sega Genesis, SNES, Commodore, Amiga, and a couple of handheld consoles, they decided to largely ignore the fact that he was a basketball player. And we didn't get treated to Shaq's match fishing either, which is a bit of a missed opportunity. No, no, no. We got Shaq Fu. Is this going to be a fighting game with Shaq? Can anyone fight Shaq? He's enormous. I feel like even Neo, like with all of his downloaded Superboy skills, would not be able to defeat Shaq. He's just too big. It's like trying to defeat a building with Kung Fu. Actually, in The Matrix, they could do that, couldn't they? Matrix was a silly but brilliant movie. The nonsensical mumbo jumbo storylines kicks off with Shaq heading out to a charity basketball, basketball match in Tokyo. But the basketball references end right there before we hit the ma main game. And this is because Shaq accidentally steps through a portal into another dimension where he bumps into a martial arts master called Liotsu. Shaq is instantly recognized by Liotsu as a warrior from the stars and is entrusted with a mission to rescue a young boy from the evil mummy Set Ra. So, oh my god, I've walked into a parallel dimension where cliches are everywhere. Um, all this really boils down to is a bonkers fighting game in which professional basketball player Shaq takes on baddies and mummies and evil demons and other sh like that. It might not have been so bad if Shaq's combat repertoire had perhaps included the use of, say, a basketball, but no. His moves are actually very limited, clunky, and unresponsive. This feels like one of those games where it's like, yeah, 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 they had a game and it wasn't selling very well. So they got a celebrity, they basically stuck their face on it and was like, yeah, 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 now it's Shaq's Kung Fu rather than just Kung Fu Master 3. Uh, just to sell a few more sh games. Brilliant idea, so beats my capitalist heart. In fact, it's been demonstrated that attempting to master all Shaq's moves and combos is a complete waste of time as this will only impede your progress. Shaq Fu does not reward such dedication and mastery. Instead, the best bet is to just blindly smash all the buttons and hope for the best. Although Shaq Fu often crops up in lists of the worst video games ever made, it probably doesn't deserve such a bad reputation. Yes, it's a very poor combat game, but I'm sure we've all played worse. The main bone of contention seems to be the completely nutty idea of getting a professional basketball player to endorse your game and then sending them off into another dimension to defeat evil mummies via the medium of Kung Fu. It'd be like me putting my face on like, I don't know, soup. <laughs> it's like, what's I've got to do with soup? Absolutely nothing. How did we get into indoor soup? Well, it would be like in... The, the, there is no... I'm like, think of a logical connection. The point is there shouldn't be a logical connection. Which is insane. Although if anyone wants to, you know, any suit makers out there, <laughs> that'd be kind of funny. As Nintendo Power put it, it's not possible to come up with a worse idea than this. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, it is Nintendo Power. There are loads of worse ideas. Let me tell you a little thing about genocide, Nintendo Power. Uh, but some people really seem to hate it. I think Nintendo Power, when they said there is no way to come up with a worse idea, would be one of those people, Danny, I'm just saying. Several years later, the website ShaqFu.com gained a cult following of haters who were devoted to the complete obliteration of the game from history by locating and destroying every single copy you people need hobbies that they could get their hands on. Kill them all. Kill them all. But the game had some fans too. In a counter-attack move, the website Save Shaq Fu was also set up to try and save all of the copies from being destroyed by the loonies at shaqfu.com. Well, we know you got the better domain, didn't we? 24 years later, in 2018, please, if anyone tells me people still cared about this, I'll be so distraught. A new software studio called Big D's decided to sell up an indie go go. Oh, people can play. Ah! Oh, Pierre, ah! Oh, so painful. Daddy, chill. 
campaign for a sequel which would Shaq Fu Reborn. And quite remarkably, with the help of the big man himself, they managed to secure over $450,000 in funding for a sequel to this crap game. It really is amazing what a celebrity endorsement can sell. Holy sh**. Thanks largely to the tongue-in-cheek marketing, which blatantly took the piss out of the original game and proclaimed that the sequel would finally right a wrong. The wrong was the whole game is f***ing stupid. How are you going to write that? The whole problem is it's not about basketball. The only way that this would be good would be if the game, the new game, is actually about f***ing basketball. For f***ing sake. Shaq Fu Reborn was released on a range of formats, including PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch. But it was met with an underwhelming response, although most agreed it was at least an improvement on the original. Let's forget this ever happens. Let's forget what everything in the script ever happens. There's no lessons to be learned. There's no value. It's just like people just making stuff for no reason. Kind of feeling a little irony here. <laughs> On a side note, every, even the name Shaq Fu was lame and nonsensical. Kung Fu is Chinese martial arts, yet the real world segment of the game was supposed to take place in Japan. The developers would have been better off sticking with their original name of Shaq Attack. Yeah, they would have, because that's actually a cool name. But perhaps we should just be grateful that the poor reception received by Shaq Fu meant that we never got to see Tiger Woods at the Gates of Hell, Serena Williams vs. the mutant zombie flesh-eating chickens from Mars, and Lance Armstrong's drug-free professional cycling. Ah! That is very good, Danny. That is very... Mwah! Great job. No, I know enough about sports to know that Lance Armstrong was on all sorts of shit. Boonga boonga! Uh, it's always intriguing to come across a new arcade game with a unusual controller stuck to the front of the cabinet. Daring to venture beyond the traditional joysticks and buttons, the arcade halls have often played host to a wealth of titles featuring racing wheels or light guns or the handlebars of the like. Well, one particular arcade game in Japan in 2001 featured what may be the most bizarre controller in human history. A plastic human ass. <laughs> okay. Well, it's actually a model of just the bottom half of a human bent over from behind, but the plastic buttocks and legs are covered up by a nice pair of jeans, so it might not be quite as depraved as you were originally thinking. Yes, I was just assuming they were naked. Uh, it's probably far worse. Oh my god. Is it about how hard you can slap a butt or something? That's, that's so weird. That's, I mean, I don't know if that's it, but I get the feeling it might be. And I get the feeling this is straight out of, like, Japan. Boonga Boonga was developed by the South Korean company. Oh, no, I got it wrong. TAF system for the Japanese market. Yes! Yes! I mean, I mean, <laughs> nailed it. Nailed it. Daniel, let me down the path. And then we nailed it together. Ha! Gay! And it's not hugely surprising that it never found a market outside of Japan. Danny, yes! Although some of the greatest arcade games of all time have originated in Japan, there's a long list of hundreds of titles which never made it outside the country, largely because they were too f***ing weird. No, I don't know what the answer is. Large aside, don't, don't call the Japanese people weird! I mean, like, yeah, but they made some, I mean, look, to me, as a European dude, yeah, they're weird. I'm sure the Japanese look at plenty of like we do. Being like you eat cereal for breakfast, like sweet, like in the milk of cows. That is weird, dude. And I'm like, yeah, okay, the we think's weird. The I, I, they think's weird. But still, people are gonna be like, Simon, it's not weird, just because the culture's slightly different. I mean, like, no, it's, it's not weird to them. Of course, it's not. It's just weird to me. That's okay. That's okay, hashtag cancel Simon. Largely because Japanese developers have this tendency to slap random nudity into the code of many of these games. Legends. What might seem on first glance to be a completely innocent arcade version of pinball or the card game Mahjong or even the board game Othello will often reward the player with female nudity after you've completed the first level. And this can range from relatively tame manga style animations to full on explicit video footage. Holy <laughs> Japan. The whole subgenre of erotic Japanese video games is known as erogi, and it wouldn't really fly in the North American or European markets, where most of us are still giggling at the thought of what the butler saw mutoscopes from the early 20th century. I have no idea what that is. What is a mutoscope? <laughs> Sounds weird. And surprisingly futuristic for early 20th century. Like, come downstairs and look at my mutoscope. <laughs> I don't know why it would be downstairs or why it would be upstairs. Could have said come through to the parlor or something 
really old and early 20th century. But I'm not sure that Boonga Boonga would even really fall into the Eroge category. There's no nudity on display here at all. Instead, the remarkably simple format invites you to choose from one of eight animated faces on the screen that you would like to punish. The choice includes a mother-in-law, an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, a gangster, a prostitute, a redhead gold digger, and a child molester. Holy sh**. This started off as like a bit of a laugh, and then it was like, no, no, no. It's basically a therapy unit. <laughs> what are we going to do? We're going to beat the sh** out of a child molester. <laughs> oh my god. After you've made your choice, you prepare yourself in front of the giant bent over bottom. Now the game is also known as Spankum, and so this may give you some clue as to what exactly the game involves. But you'd be dead wrong. Because there's another accessory attached to the front of the cabinet, which I haven't mentioned yet, and Lord have mercy on our souls. It's only a giant plastic finger. What? Oh, what? Oh, what? This can't be going where I think it's going. <laughs> is it? Yes! The point of the game is to use the finger to poke and probe the back passage of the controller until the animated face on the screen so your mother-in-law starts wailing and screaming in agony. Holy sh**, man. Did we invent a game where the idea is to stick a finger up the bottom of a child molester? Or your mother-in-law? Again, let me repeat. What the f***, Japan? <laughs> If you perform particularly well, the machine will dispense a little plastic, plastic trophy which has been charmingly shaped into a pile of feces. I don't even know what to say anymore. I really don't. Now, all this might sound a little odd to Western ears, but it's actually based on a popular school prank in Japan and South Korea, which goes under the name Kancho. <laughs> the idea behind Kancho is to sneak up on an unsuspecting friend and put both your fingers together into a gun show. No, and then thrust your index fingers into your buddy's butthole while triumphantly exclaiming, Kancho. That is weird, my dudes. I mean, I know, like, kids at schools, they have some, like, weird pranks and shit they do to each other. Like, I have been a kid. We got up to all sorts of crazy shit. But this, this we did not get up to. <laughs> And although this kind of behavior might be frowned upon in the West, it would be quite likely to end up in sexual assault charges. It's the kind of East Asian version of a wedgie. You'd probably get into a spot of bother if you tried to get to your teacher. But it's considered relatively harmless fun among buddies who are just doing it for shit and giggles. The makers of the game also point out in their defense that the characters in the game upon which you inflict your punishment are all purposefully unlikable. <laughs> what? Okay. This is so weird. I mean, yes for the uh, the child molester. But the red-haired gold digger, a prostitute, I mean a gangster, sure, ex-boyfriends or girlfriends, they're just people you don't like, not people who are inherently unlikable. Holy sh**. Other than a gangster and a child molester, f those guys. And a gold digger, I mean, let's not put them on the same level as a child molester good lord although there are a clear issue few issues with mother-in-law and the prostitute being lumped into the same category as child molester yes thank you the arcade game i really don't read these ahead danny and i are just somehow spiritually aligned did i say spiritually spiritually that's the word the arcade game appears to get appeared to get a strong reception when it was first unveiled at the 2000 Tokyo Game Show, and it was reported that an initial contract had been drawn up for distribution of the first 200 machines. However, it's been reported that only five of these units were ever distributed. It seems that the now bankrupt TAF Systems had possibly overestimated the demand for a video game in which you anally probe your mother-in-law. <laughs> Even in Japan. <laughs> Good lordy lord. Dragon's Lair. There are apparently only three of the most influential and pioneering arcade games in history to have a permanent spot on display in the prestigious Smithsonian Institute, the largest museum in the world. One of them is Pong, one of them is Pac-Man, and the third arcade game is Dragon's Lair. And that's a sh I've never heard of Dragon's Lair. And that's a shame, because although this may seem like a controversial entry on which to wrap up this video, I strongly believe that Dragon's Lair is one of the most utterly ludicrous video games of all time, and it plays like a pig. So what the f*** is it doing in there with Pac-Man and Pong, which are legit? I have a vague memory of catching a glimpse of Dragon's Lair in the, arc in the arcades for the first time, although this was probably long after it was originally released in 1983. My jaw dropped to the floor when I saw the cartoon quality graphics on the screen. This was unlike anything else I'd ever seen in an arcade. It appeared as if I was looking at a beautifully animated proper film, but a film that I could somehow play. Oh my god, the, the joy. I could have got my money out of my pockets fast enough to have a go, but it was at this point that I discovered something else about the game that made me raise 
a young, inquisitive eyebrow. It was 50 pence a turn. Bloody hell. In the 1980s? This was by far the most expensive video game to play in the arcades at the time, and it was the equivalent to five whole goes on Space Invaders. But I wasn't going to miss out on this. I shoved my money in and prepared to enter the new dimension of video gaming. Actually, I shoved loads of money in. Within the space of a few minutes, I'd gone through about a fiver. Oh my god. Like, five pounds as a child in the 1980s is savage. Like, I grew up in the 1990s, early 2000s. Five pounds would buy you a load of stuff. Nowadays, it's like you have lunch and it's like, if it's five pounds, it's a bargain. <laughs> what? <laughs> bargain inflation? It's the worst. And I was still none the wiser as to what the hell I was supposed to be doing. All I kept seeing was a cartoon knight getting mashed up in various different death scenes, and there was little I could do to prevent this from happening. I think it was also the shortest time I'd ever spent in an arcade before running out of money and leaving the place in an embarrassed disappointment. Dragon's Lair was animated by Don Bluth, the former Walt Disney animator in the 1970s who became disenchanted with the studio's output, and went on to work for his own independent film projects in the 1980s, including An American Trail, The Land Before Time, and one of Simon's all-time favorites, All Dogs go to heaven. Uh, I can't pass judgment on that because I've never seen it and never will. Although now I have children, so I guess I'll have to watch all these movies with them, which is kind of a bummer. I hope they don't like Star Wars. Here's a phone. Call somebody who cares. In this bold new swords and sorcery cartoon, oh, swords and sorcery. <laughs> Uh, released by Cinematronic. Oh, Simon, don't do the head shooting thing. It reminds me of suicide. It's a trigger. Oh my god, get over yourself. Uh, released by Cinematronic, you took the role of a reluctant put-up-on hero, Dirk the Daring, in a mission to rescue his beloved Princess Daphne, who was being held captive in a castle belonging to an evil dragon called Singe. I read that whole paragraph and just couldn't care less about any of these people or their quests or worries. The alleged innovation of Dragon's Lair was how the game made use of new laser disc technology. For the most part, the game was effectively displaying an animated film on laser disc, but unlike the linear nature of VHS and Betamax, laser disc could dynamically access different parts of the disc depending on the actions of the player. It's pretty cool technology for the time, isn't it? This sounds quite cool in print. Damn it, God! People are going to start doubting that I don't read these ahead of time. This sounds quite cool in principle, but the execution was frankly terrible. The game would only become interactive for fleeting moments throughout the film, and in that split second you had to decide whether to push the joystick left, right, up, down, or press the fire button. But the problem was that the screen display offered very little clue as to what action you were supposed to take. In effect, the whole game became a massive ordeal of trial and error. Danny, it sounds like they succeeded though, because you put five pounds into that machine, didn't you? You would wait for an interactive moment, randomly take an action, watch Dirk the Daring meet a grisly death, and then try a different action next time. <laughs> a brilliant way to squeeze money out of young children. When you finally stumbled upon the correct action, you would need to memorize this and then prepare for the next interactive moment, repeating the whole cycle of luck and memory, until you eventually get to Princess Daphne, who has probably died of boredom or old age by this point. Apparently, the full correct sequence only involves 12 minutes of animated footage interspersed with random interactive spots, but considering the price per turn and the rapid death count, it would probably take you at least £1,200 to reach that point. <laughs> Savage. No kid has that amount of money. Uh, unless he's maybe the son of that Saudi dude we mentioned earlier who's playing that other... he's playing shopping simulator or something. Despite my own reservations about the fundamentally awful game design, Dragon's Lair had many devoted fans. The cartoon graphics initially drew in huge crowds, and the game had already generated $32 million of profit by 1984. Cha-ching! <laughs> it worked. Not only that, it spawned several arcade sequels, various ports and remakes, and everything from the Game Boy to Xbox to short-lived cartoon TV series. And now Netflix have very recently confirmed a Dragon's Lair movie it's rumored to star Ryan Reynolds as Dirk the Daring. I love Ryan Reynolds. And I have to say that I'm not totally against Dirk, because I have a soft spot for other versions of the game. For example, the Spectrum and C4, C64 conversions could never hope to replicate the cartoon graphics of the original arcade machine, so the coders had to come up with a drastic solution. They had to create a vaguely playable game instead. Imagine. <laughs> but for me. The original version of Dragon's Lair just sees Dirk the Daring all dressed up in fancy graphics with nowhere to go except expensive, endless doom. And there's no way it deserves to put, be on show at the Smithsonian Institute. Why is it at the Smithsonian Institute? This game just sounds like... I mean, I guess it was a bit revolutionary to use the graphics that way and then skip about on the Laserdisc thing. But if it sucks, it f***ing sucks, doesn't it? 
Just think of all the other classic arcade games that could have taken that prestigious third spot. Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, Frogger Defender, Street Fighter 2. All good games. This might be pushing it uh, a little too far up the arcade rectum, but I suspect that even Boonga Boonga would have made more of a snug fit. But a bum bum -tsh! This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. Am I wearing the appropriate shirt? I am! Yes! Magellan TV was the sponsor of today's video. Those legends. I'm going to link to them below. And thank you for watching. And then you train and you're like, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs>